Hi, I am Makiza Latifa. It's such a lovely morning and I'm more than excited to be coming your way with today's edition of China Now, the only show and platform that gives you all the information you need to know about China and what it's been up to. So Chris will start us off as he always does with a weekly news report of what's been trending in China in the past few days. And among the top news is details of an explosion that occurred in a building in the town of Yinzhou, located to the east of Beijing, on March 13, 2024, causing severe damage to several surrounding buildings. There's also some news about TikTok and others, so kindly stay with us for more details. China Current is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting-edge technologies. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. On March 13th, the U.S. House of Representatives voted in favor of a bill titled Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversaries by Controlling Application Risks Act. In the morning session, the bill demands that ByteDance divest its control over its popular short video app TikTok, with the alternative being a potential ban of the app in the United States. The bill must now be passed by the U.S. Senate before it can be presented to President Joe Biden for his approval. U.S. media outlet CNN described the bill as the most aggressive legislation targeting TikTok to come out of a congressional committee since company CEO Sho Zhu testified to lawmakers last year that the app poses no threat to Americans in a grueling hearing. Chinese observers said the passing of the TikTok bill demonstrated a persistent campaign by some U.S. politicians to hunt down the social media platform which has enjoyed worldwide success and is set to then stabilizing ties between the two countries. Cooperation is the only sensible way forward in the field of science and technology, they noted. The bill, led by Republican Mike Gallagher and Democrat Raja Krishnamurti, aims to address the so-called national security risks over TikTok's ties to China. With 170 million American users, TikTok has achieved a massive scale, making an outright ban far more complicated. This bill would only block the app from being distributed through official app stores, not prohibit existing users. As the 2024 election nears and TikTok's US influence grows, political and corporate interests in both parties appear motivated to bring the platform under domestic control. Ironically, the very man who started all these witch hunting farce, former President Donald Trump, has shifted his position to against the ban on TikTok. Trump is expected to be the Republican candidate in this year's election against Joe Biden. Next up, an explosion occurred in a building in the town of Yanjiao, located to the east of Beijing on March 13th, causing severe damage to several surrounding buildings. And as of the time of press, this incident has resulted in two deaths and 26 injured local authorities said. At 7.54 a.m. on that day, a suspected gas leak led to a deflagration incident at a fried chicken shop in Yanjiao in Sanhe, Langfang in North China's Hebei province, local authorities said. Local fire, emergency and medical departments had quickly arrived on the scene to deal with the situation, according to media reports. As of 1.30 p.m., 28 people have been recovered from the scene of the accident. Among them, two people have been confirmed dead, and 26 were injured, according to Ji Hong Tu, head of the Emergency Management Bureau of the Sanhe City, in an interview at the scene with China Central Television. The injured have been taken to nearby hospitals, with most of them suffering from minor injuries. On March 14th, the local authority in Sanghe apologized for forcibly dissuading reporters from China Central Television and other media outlets from covering the incident. This has sparked wide discussion on protecting journalists' rights and duties when covering sudden incidents of public concern, especially in cases of disasters. Some videos circulating online on Wednesday showed a reporter from CCTV who was conducting a live broadcast at the core site of the explosion being approached by two men in black. They blocked the camera and interrupted reporter's live broadcaster interview. At that moment, the reporter was described in local traffic conditions, saying that a safety cordon was set up 500 meters away. Next up, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said on March 13th 
that it's in the common interest of China and India to resolve the border issue as soon as possible, responding to a question related to claims by Indian officials that stationing so many troops on the border is not in the common interest of both countries. Wang said during the regular press conference that it is hoped that the two sides will find a mutually acceptable solution as soon as possible, in accordance with the consensus of the leaders of the two countries and the spirit of the relevant agreements. According to a report from the Indian Express, India's External Affairs Minister S. Jashankar said at a Monday event in New Delhi that he thinks it's in the common interest that the line of actual control should not play host to that many forces. It's also in common interest that China and India should observe agreements that they have, and it's not just in common interest, he believes it's also in China's interest as well. Next up, let's take a look at the Taiwan Strait. According to Taiwan's United Daily News report, Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen, deputy leader and later elect Lai Ching-te went to Kaohsiung-based Taiwan Shipbuilding Corporation to attend a ceremony of the Taiwan Marine Patrol's department, Jia Yi class patrol ship, third ship Yunling ship delivery, and a fourth Taipei ship naming launch ceremony. At a ceremony, Tsai Ing-wen said that the two newly delivered ships were the largest in tonnage in the Taiwan Marine Patrol Department. According to Taiwan Media Reports, the delivery Yunlin ship, Taipei ship tonnage are 4,000 tons. Yunlin ship is said to be able to withstand strong winds of 10, able to range 1,000 nautical miles, equipped with three sets of high-pressure water cannons with a range of 120 meters, and has the equivalent of a field hospital level of medical compartments. Despite Tsai's touting of two new ships at a ceremony, Taiwan's former Air Force Vice Commander Zhang Yanting has pointed out that compared to the number and strengths of the mainland's ships, the Taiwan authorities had overstretched. He said that the mainland also has marine police ships, marine surveillance ships, fisheries vessels. There are 99 marine police ships of more than 1,000 tons, 46 ships of more than 3,000 tons, and two ships of 10,000 tons. On the contrary, the Taiwan authorities do not have any 5,000 or 6,000 ton ships at all, and the mainland has an absolute advantage at sea. Earlier this year, a mainland fishing boat was crushed by the Taiwanese Marine Patrol, causing two deaths. Taiwanese authorities refused to apologize and led to an escalation of tension in the region. Next up, on March 10th, the first batches of 2024 saving bonds were officially issued in China. Residents rushed to buy them with enthusiasm. A number of banks in Beijing sold out their quotas in the morning and the quotas of large banks being particularly tight, being snapped up in just an hour. According to the announcement of the Ministry of Finance of China, the first and second issues of 2024 savings treasury bonds were issued from March 10th to March 19th. Both issues of treasury bonds are fixed rate and fixed maturity varieties. The first issue has a maturity of three years with a maximum issuance of 15 billion yuan and a coupon rate of 2.38% per annum. The second issue has a maturity of five years with a maximum issuance of 15 billion yuan and a coupon rate of 2.5% per annum. Next up, in an exclusive interview with CGTN before the national two sessions, Lu Guoquan, member of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference and director of the Office of All China Federation of Trade Unions, has for the first time proposed to legislate the right to disconnect in order to increase the legal costs for companies imposing invisible overtime. The suggestion has sparked widespread discussion. On March 10th, Liu responded to CGTN confirming that the proposal has been officially filed and relevant departments will soon communicate with him and provide a response. Liu stated that during the group discussion attended by relevant personnel from the Supreme People's Court and Supreme People's Procuratorate, he also suggested the right to disconnect should be a major point of discussion. He recommended conducting research in collaboration of the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security and All China Federation of Trade Unions. Furthermore, Liu expressed the view that if employees are working online, they should receive appropriate compensation. Additionally, he argued that securing necessary living conditions at the expense of one's health is unsustainable for both business and workers. Last but not least, let's take a look at the EVs. During a recent interview, economist Fu Peng commented on the development of new energy industry, noting its positive direction. However, he highlighted that the industry has become fiercely competitive, with a significant price war escalating from last year to this one. According to Food, the new energy vehicle sector is quickly experiencing its first round of overcapacity, which is fundamentally what has sparked the price competition. 
This trend actually started last year, and Fu predicts the current year could witness the most severe price war in the new energy vehicle market to date. Despite Fu's prediction, CATL, the world's largest manufacturer for car battery, has once again experienced a sharp increase in stock, soaring over 10% with a trade volume surpassing 7 billion yuan. According to reports, Morgan Stanley has indicated that the price war draws to a close. CATL is gearing up to enhance cost efficiency through a new generation of large-scale production lines and to expand its advantage in terms of return on net assets. Observing multiple turning points in the fundamentals of CATL, Morgan Stanley has upgraded the company's rating to overweight and selected it as a top pick in the industry. The firm has also raised its target price for CATL by 14% to 210 yuan. Well, that's all for the day. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts and comments about our show, please reach us at the email address below. I'm Chris, looking forward to hearing from you and see you next time. Thank you, Chris. Now let's turn our attention to Threshold as Lisa is ready to delve into the tech world and give you the latest technological innovations happening in today's China. And China leads the way with 5.5G accelerating towards an intelligent future. I bet you want to know what exactly this 5.5G is and why it is even necessary. Lisa has got you covered on that, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Lisa and this is Threshold in China. Today, we are going to share some exciting tech innovations and announcements that happened in China recently. The next generation of mobile communication is on its way and is called 5.5G. While 5G networks are still being implemented worldwide, telecom companies and tech giants are already looking ahead to 6G. However, before we get to 6G, there is an important transition phase known as the 5.5G or 5G Advanced. Recently, Huawei officially released the world's first comprehensive 5.5G intelligent core network solution. This solution is currently undergoing joint testing with multiple carriers in regions such as the Middle East, Asia-Pacific, Europe and of course in China. The aim is to pave the way for large-scale global commercialization of 5.5G as early as this year. But what exactly is 5.5G and why is it necessary? As the name suggests, 5.5G is an intermediate step between 5G and 6G. While the addition of the 0.5G may not seem significant, but it offers improvements in areas like connection speeds, latency, that is the time it takes for data to travel, position and accuracy, and reliability. In fact, it is expected to deliver performance boost of approximately 10 times compared to the initial 5G networks. One of the biggest advantages of 5.5G is faster data speeds. While 5G's download rate starts around 1 GIPS, 5.5G can reach up to 10 GIPS. This is important for demanding applications like extended reality and naked eye 3D. Upload speeds will also increase from hundreds of MIPS to over 1 GIPS, enabling capabilities such as mass cloud data transfer and widespread holographic communication. But of course, there are more to offer than just faster speeds. It improves connectivity in all situations, supporting trillions of connected devices. These devices can range from fast industrial machines to small IoT sensors. With 5.5G data travel time latency will be reduced to just a few milliseconds. The accuracy of location identification can also improve from meters with 5G to centimeters with 5.5G. In simple terms, 5.5G makes connections more reliable, faster, and precise for all types of devices, not just phones and computers. These technical capabilities will drive transformations in various industries. For example, in manufacturing, the super-fast speeds and low latency of 5.5G will allow for better remote monitoring of machines, real-time data analysis, and optimized supply chain logistics. 
cutting edge sectors like artificial intelligence, AR, VR, and brain computer interfaces will finally have the powerful networking they need to reach their full potential. China has established the world's first 5.5G demonstration zone in Beijing to showcase its advantages, such as fully automated smart logistics using a fleet of self-driving delivery vehicles. With 5.5G's huge bandwidth, sensor data from these vehicles can be continuously uploaded to frequently retained AI driving systems, making them safer every day. China's major telecommunication companies have started regional trials for 5.5G. For example, China Mobile aims to cover more than 300 cities with 5.5G this year. While 5.5G is coming soon, the development of 6G is still underway, with a plan rolled out around 2030. On another note, the United States and nine other nations have endorsed a set of principles to advance 6G technology due to the intensifying competition with China in developing the next generation wireless connections. In a joint statement, these nations outline principles for 6G systems, including the use of trusted technology protective of national security. Analysts view this as an attempt to limit China's 6G development. However, given China's large market and the independent strategies of tech giants like Huawei, it is uncertain as to how effective they are in slowing China's development. Imagine being able to charge your electric vehicles in just 10 minutes, even in freezing temperatures as low as minus 80 degrees Celsius. Scientists from Zhejiang University in China have made a significant breakthrough in battery technology. They have developed a new electrolyte, a key component of lithium-ion batteries that allows them to operate and charge efficiently at extremely low temperatures. For years, lithium-ion batteries have struggled to perform well in cold conditions, limiting their use in electric vehicles, aviation, and polar exploration. But with this new electrolyte made up of tiny solvent molecules, that could be changed. This work is so groundbreaking because high energy density, wide temperature operating range, and fast charging have been impossible to achieve simultaneously in previous battery designs because these properties seem to contradict one another. Increasing energy density often meant using electrode materials that were less stable in extreme temperatures. Electrolytes that enable fast charging could sacrifice energy density or temperature resilience. And designing for a wide temperature range often compromises energy density or charging rate. It has been a challenge to optimize all three factors simultaneously with conventional battery designs. However, the new electrolyte made from tiny fluoroacetonitrile solvent molecules overcomes these challenges. It has a unique ligand channel transport mechanism that allows for ultra efficient lithium ion movement. This mechanism enables the new electrolyte to achieve high energy density, a wide temperature operating range, and fast charging. It allows for ultra-fast ion transport even at freezing temperatures. In fact, compared to conventional electrolytes, the new electrolyte has an incredibly high ionic conductivity, 10,000 times higher at minus 70 degrees Celsius. The researchers also found that this electrolyte design principle is also effective for sodium ion and potassium ion batteries, expanding the possibilities for energy storage solutions. While this work is currently a proof of concept, there are still challenges to address before this technology can be commercialized. One potential challenge is lowering the cost of the solvent used in the electrolyte. However, the lead scientist, Professor Fan Xiuling, is optimistic and believes that this electrolyte can reach commercial use in the future. And that is all for today's threshold. We hope you like this new section on science and technology in China. As usual, we welcome your feedback and thoughts. Thank you, Lisa, for the details. Next on the show is the Thinkers Forum. Well, here's where you hear from our thinkers and scholars who have so much knowledge to share with us on very important topics. Yanis Varoufakis is a former finance minister of Greece, and he'll be speaking on whether or not the U.S. should worry about China's economic slowdown. 
there is no comparison between the difficulties that the Chinese economy is having to the fundamental systemic crisis of the European economy. In my view, China is um, experiencing the natural slowdown of an economy which for 30 years has been growing very fast. COVID was the reason why that slowdown took, t- took place now. It, if China has had a, a mounting debt at the level of the prefectures, I mean, the local government for a while, whenever debt increases, then at some point there is a slowdown until it's consolidated. Europe is nowhere near the level of um, systemic cohesion that China has. Europe is fragmented. Think about our monetary system. Our monetary system is uh, designed to create problems. Like, you know, when you drive your car, you may have an accident. Let's hope you don't. But your car is not designed to have an accident. (laughs) It was not created to have an accident. Okay? An accident is something that can be avoided. If you are a bit more careful, you drive a bit more slowly, you respect the road rules, you will not have an accident. The European monetary system was designed to have an accident. (laughs) <laughs> um, why am I saying that? We have a central bank that doesn't have a common treasury, Ministry of Finance, next to it. This is the only central bank in the world that doesn't have a common treasury to issue common debt on behalf of the whole of the Eurozone. So we have a central bank without a state behind it because the European Central Bank is not allowed to help our member states. It's not allowed. So in Japan, since the 1990s, when the, the, the Japanese government is in debt or has a deficit, the central bank of Japan can finance the government. In the European Central Bank, that's not allowed. So that's point number one. Point number two, we have separate banking systems. So France has its own banking system. Italy has its own banking system. When the banking system of France is in trouble, the French government must bail it out. But it doesn't have a central bank from which it can actually seek help. Now, th- that's what I'm saying. This was It was like again, to use the parable of a car, it was like removing the shock absorbers from your car, the shock absorbers which allow, if there's a bump, you know, for the wheel to go up so that the the car doesn't get extremely shaken. This is our own central banks and separate currencies. And then driving the car into a pothole. That's what we've done here. The result is this, that the German economy, which was always a driving force behind the European economy, which relied for years, for decades, on selling their net exports to Greece, to Italy, to Spain. They were a manufacturing miracle. They were producing a lot more cars and washing machines and refrigerators and chemicals that they wanted, that they could absorb, that they could buy. And they were selling them to us Greeks, to the French, to the Italians and so on. And that was creating a surplus, which was coming back into Germany, which was then leaving Germany in the form of loans. Now, there was a recycling system. That broke down in 2008, completely. And now we have countries like Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, that through austerity, they have been pushed to a lower level of of, uh, economic activity, which means that our countries cannot absorb the exports of Germany. Now, this is a connection with China. Since 2009, China took over from the south of Europe, and your economy imported from Germany. The cars and washing machines and chemicals and propellers and submarines and so on. So China stabilized Germany and therefore stabilized Europe. But at some point, two things happened. Firstly, the Chinese manufacturing sector advanced to a stage where you don't need to import stuff from Germany anymore. Now you've got Volkswagen that comes to China to recruit Chinese engineers because they don't have enough engineers in Germany. That's the first thing that has happened. The second thing that has happened is the new Cold War that was unleashed initially by Donald Trump against China and then turbocharged by Joe Biden. And Washington is forcing Europe and Germany to de-risk, to de-globalize, to effectively to reduce its economic relations with China. In other words, to sell less to China. Now they're going to introduce a stupid tax on electric cars, BYD and so on, coming from China to Germany. And what do they expect? That then the Chinese will buy more stuff from them? No, the opposite is going to happen. The whole model of the European economy, which is based on the division between surplus countries like Germany and deficit countries like Greece, that was shaken really badly in 2008. 
China stabilized that model. In addition to that, because of COVID-19 and the data crisis, China and the United States have two advantages, major advantages, that Europe doesn't have. One is China and the United States developed a new form of capital, which I explained in my latest book, Technofeudalism. I call it cloud capital. So, you know, Tencent and uh, Alibaba in China, Apple, Google, and uh, uh, Amazon in the United States. They've created a new form of capital where the value added comes from this interaction between the cloud and machines. Europe has not done that. We are still good at producing very nice bags, you know, Hermes bags and Louis Vuitton and Ferrari cars and so on, but no cloud capital, which means that it is missing out on a new industrial revolution that the United States and China are pushing ahead, especially now with AI and so on. Uh, the second reason that uh, the second huge problem that, that Europe has is low levels of investment in green technologies because of the crisis of that I described before. And the fact that they've been bailing out their bankers with austerity for the many, that has depressed investment on everything from cloud capital to green technologies. So now that we need to have access to green technologies, solar panels, wind uh, turbines, and so on, there aren't enough in Europe. And they are introducing more tariffs on Chinese solar panels to satisfy the Americans. So we are falling and falling and falling. In other words, do not make the mistake of comparing and contrasting the Chinese economic slowdown with what's happening in Europe. Europe has lost... It's like you know being at the train station to discover that the train has left the station. Europe is in perfect decline. I do not see how this is going to be reversed. It's getting worse. We used to have a divide between the north and the south. Now we have a divide between the east and the west because of the war in Ukraine. With the rise of fascism, we have not made any moves towards consolidating, towards having a federal government that can plan ahead for Europe. Marx was a very smart person. He never predicted anything. Right. I mean, if you read carefully Marx, and I have read Marx very carefully, what he says is completely correct. That capitalism is a necessary condition for socialism. But he didn't say that socialism is inevitable. <laughs> that if you have capitalism, then you're going to have socialism. No. In order to have socialism, you have to have capitalism. That's what Marx says. And I agree with him. Rosa Luxemburg, the great communist revolutionary and the great idol of mine, put it very bravely uh, when she said, when she was in a prison cell, she put a question to us. Socialism or barbarism? After capitalism, you may get socialism or you may get barbarism. <laughs> and what I'm saying in my book is that we're getting a very technologically advanced form of barbarism. Because the left has failed here in Europe. We are the great losers. So organized labor, which was supposed to create the circumstances for the proletariat to take over the means of production, the machinery, capital. Hmm? Well, either our trade unions have been destroyed or have been co-opted by capital and the bankers. So organized labor did not manage to rise up against capital and take over capital. And you've had, one of the reasons was the, the, the Soviet Union experiment, which was a disaster, to the extent that the working class of the Soviet Union did not rise up to support communism. Um, they applauded the fall of communism, and they embraced a kind of gangster capitalism that we now see in Russia. And therefore, you had the complete triumph of capital after 1991 with globalization and all this. In the process, because Marx was absolutely right to say that capitalism is not sustainable. Capitalism creates its own enemy within itself in the form of organized labor, in the form of economic crisis of 1929, of 2008. You know, it wasn't the left that created 2008. It was the bankers in Wall Street. They're like stupid viruses that kill the organism that they infect. That was Marx's point about capitalism, right? So one of the things that happened was, well, the main thing that happened, and this is my what I say in my book, Technic Feudalism, is that capital triumphed so much, it was so successful that it mutated into a more toxic version of itself, which I call cloud capital. And cloud capital overthrew capitalism. And what do I mean by overthrew through capitalism? It didn't create you know, a new system of government, no. But without us, before 
without us even realizing, it ended the two main forces of capitalism. What are the two main forces of capitalism? According to Marx, one is profit. Under feudalism, it was rent. The feudal lord, the baron, extracted value from the peasant by force. That's rent. That's not profit. You know, you produce 100 kilograms of rice and I come and take 60 away from you. Right? <laughs> That's not a market process. This is an extractive process, a brutish, forceful extraction of rent from you. I take it because I am the lord. I have property rights over the land on which you grow the rice. But capitalism replaced this extractive process by a market process. Instead of being a peasant, you become a proletariat, a proletarian. You get paid a wage which is lower than the value of the rice you produce. Your labor is a commodity like rice, so it looks as if it is completely voluntary and free. It's a market system. But in the end, you get exploited because of surplus value. But think of what cloud capital does, whether it's Alibaba or um, Amazon or Baidu or T Tencent, WeChat, whatever. You have machinery which is no longer created to produce things. So if you, a steam engine or industrial robot is a produced means of production. It's a machine that you produce in order to produce other things, other stuff. But cloud capital is a produced means of changing our behavior, not to producing stuff. So, you know, big tech is in the business of changing our behavior in a way which can then turn into a new form of rent for the owners of this cloud capital, of this produced means of our behavioral modification. So the moment you get into Amazon.com, you exit the market. Because Amazon.com belongs to one man, Jeff Bezos, right? It's not a market. It's a trading place. But a trading place is not the same thing as a market. Because in a marketplace, when you go to a, you know, a, a village and there's a market, you know, lots of farmers, they, have, they sell their, their vegetables, right? Um, they're all independent of each other. You and your friend walk around. You look at the different lettuces and tomatoes and, uh, you know, fruit, and you say, oh, this looks nice. You have a little discussion. You can't do this in Amazon.com because the algorithm doesn't allow you to talk to anyone unless it is in the interest of the algorithm, the owner of the algorithm, that you talk to them, to somebody, so as to maximize that somebody's capacity to extract money from you. And the platform keeps 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. That's a rent. We are going back to the feudal rent, only it's techno-feudal. That's my, my story. So you have this replacement of markets with digital fiefdoms, and you have the replacement of profits by cloud rent. Of course, the whole system still needs a capitalist sector where value is produced. Somebody has to produce the stuff that you buy on the digital plat platform. But the producers of that stuff, both the workers and the capitalists, are vassals of the owners of the cloud fief. I call them cloud elites, the techno the lords. And this is destabilizing from a macro perspective as well. Because when so much money is taken in the form of rent, cloud rent, it doesn't return to the economy. Because you see, when if you have a bicycle producer in, back in the old days, right? This bicycle producer has a profit. Then a large part of that profit will go back into machinery for making bicycles, for improving the bicycles. So the money will be returned to the circular flow of income and investment. But Jeff Bezos... Jeff Bezos has $250 billion in the bank. If he gets another $50 billion, where is he going to invest it? He's not going to invest it. Maybe he will buy another island in Hawaii, but that's not investment. Okay? So the money is lost from this circular flow of income. That's the story of my, on my book. And also, and I think that is pertinent for people in China, I try to explain in my book the new Cold War between the United States and China. Because, you know, it's, it's just astonishing, isn't it? Up until a few years ago, I used to lecture in the United States, uh, teach there, talk to people. They all said, to me, when, when, when they wanted to defend globalization, they would say wonderful things about China. See, China has been in inducted into the global economy. Globalization works. It has lifted billions of people out of poverty. Look at China. China, China, China. And suddenly, China is the threat and must be contained. And I was asking myself, and then, why? And they would say stupid things like Taiwan. I said, what about Taiwan? Oh, they want Taiwan. They consider it to be their own. I said, yeah, they always consider it to be their own. If that's not new. Why were you struggling in the 1990s to induct China in the World Trade Organization? 
what did they think then? That Taiwan should be independent? Then they say things to me, but they are spying on us. I said, what do you mean? You are spying on everyone. I mean, the NSA is spying on me, on you, and everyone. They, they are spying on the American president. The only explanation in the last chapter, I tell my story as to what I think is the real cause of uh, the new Cold War that Trump and then Biden unleashed against China. And it's got to do with the fact that China is the only economic bloc that has developed cloud capital in competition with America's cloud capital. India hasn't. South Africa hasn't. Europe certainly hasn't. And the problem with Chinese cloud capital, from the perspective of the United States, is that in China, you've got something that they don't have. You have WeChat, which allows you to make payments without going through banks and without paying huge fees to the bankers. Now, that's not a technological thing. The Americans could have had it too. But they, the Wall Street bankers do not allow big tech, Silicon Valley, to break down, to enter the monopoly of the bankers. So there is no equivalent of WeChat. And there is no equivalent of the Chinese central bank's digital currency. Now, the Fed could have had a digital dollar, but the bankers in Wall Street would not let them. Because the bankers in Wall Street want people to have a bank account with them, not with the Fed, not with Google, not with Apple. So this clash between Silicon, big tech, cloud capital, American cloud capital, and Wall Street, which doesn't exist in China, the two work together, they've been fused. Financial capital and cloud capital in China is one thing, is giving a major advantage to Chinese cloud capital. Let's face it, why is America dominant? They are only dominant because they monopolize the international digital payment systems. They see the alternative Chinese digital payment system using cloud capital as a major threat. Because if they lose that monopoly of the dollar payment system, then America is gone. America is a country that is constantly in deficit. How are they succeeding since 1970? They've been in deficit since 1968. And yet they are the only superpower in the history of the world who are getting stronger while being in deficit because everybody else is paying in their currency. So if they lose this monopoly of the dollarized payment system, okay, then they're gone. And the Chinese cloud capital big finance agglomeration alliance is a clear and present threat for American hegemony. That is my explanation. If you don't understand the concept of cloud capital and the difference between American and Chinese cloud capital, you do not understand why we may heading for a third world war between the United States and China. And I think they did very well because uh, otherwise you rely on American cloud capital. So for instance, uh, ever since uh, the massacre in Gaza has begun, I have spent most of my day campaigning uh, in favor of peace in the Middle East against apartheid in, and so on and so forth. Now, I have to use American cloud capital. I have to use X, or formerly Twitter. I have to use YouTube. And I'm constantly in fear that somebody in Silicon Valley will switch me off. Already we've been switched off a number of times. To have access to cloud capital that is not controlled by the hegemon is essential. And I have no doubt that the Chinese authorities thought of that. The European authorities never thought of that. And that's all for today's edition of the show. I want to say thank you very kindly for making time to watch us. Please send in your thoughts and feedback through the email provided below as usual. My name is Marquisa Latifa, and I will see you same time next week.